Hey everybody, thank you for clicking on this video. Today I'm going to be reviewing and analyzing Killing Mr. Griffin. This is a YA horror suspense novel by the legendary author for kids and teens, Lois Duncan. I'm going to do this video in a bit of a half and half format. So for the first half of the video, I'm going to do a straight up spoiler free review of this book for you guys that haven't read it yet. I know this book came out in 1978, but who wants to be spoiled really? Nobody. Then, after the review, I'm going to be doing a brief analysis that will not be spoiler free. So for those of you that don't want to be spoiled for this book, you can go ahead and pause the video after my initial review, or jump ahead to this time to see my related book and movie recommendations. After all of this, if you do decide to pick up Killing Mr. Griffin, come on back to this video and talk with me about evil children in horror stuff. Hydration is important, everyone. <laughs> Killing Mr. Griffin is a YA novel published in 1978 by the great Lois Duncan. If you're not familiar with Duncan's work, you might know the 1997 movie I Know What You Did Last Summer that is actually based on a Duncan novel. She has a huge body of work in the world of children's literature, but she's most well known for her YA suspense novels like Killing Mr. Griffin. The book is about a group of teenagers who hate their high school English teacher named Mr. Griffin. He's a very strict and unforgiving teacher, and the main character, Susan, who is usually a straight-A student, even she is having trouble getting A's in Griffin's class. And she's also having trouble fitting in with her peers, so when she is approached by a group of her classmates, led by the strange and charismatic Mark Kinney, when they approach her and ask her if she wants to be part of a prank to teach Mr. Griffin a lesson by kidnapping him and making him fear for his life, Susan hesitantly says yes, and as you can imagine, the joke does not go as planned. Soon the group of teenagers find themselves in a pretty horrific situation. The text of this book has actually been edited by Duncan herself and modernized from the 1978 version. I didn't actually realize this until some way through the book and characters started talking about cell phones and Google, and I was like, it's an interesting choice to modernize this book because I think it's pretty timelessly scary and thrilling. And I did find that there are a few unedited parts of this book that do date the book a little bit. So the result is that dated elements, like teenagers saying things like how do you do and going to the diner to get a soda, that kind of thing, these dated elements exist alongside discussions of Google and cell phones and things like that. It almost makes it seem like this book is taking place in kind of an alternate history where people had modern technology in the 70s. And that's not really a criticism, actually. I think that it kind of gives the book a bit of a weird, uncanny feel that kind of works in its favor. If you guys have seen the 2014 horror movie It Follows, it takes place in sort of a 70s to 80s timeline, but one of the characters inexplicably has an e-reader. It makes it seem like the story exists outside of time in a way that is really creepy, and it's kind of the same effect here. As for the story itself, it's awesome. Duncan's writing is really, really great. It's clear, it's literary, her use of metaphor, foreshadowing, and irony is really top-notch here, and I was hooked from the first page and stayed hooked throughout the whole thing. It really performs in the way that the best thrillers do. I didn't want to stop reading. There are a number of horror elements that work really well here also. The villain of the story is truly terrifying and compelling, and although the kind of villain that he is might seem a bit familiar or even a bit cliché by today's standards, Duncan keeps the story scary and intriguing by making sure that the story revolves around his effect on the other characters. It's less about psychologizing the villain and more about the implications of what he is and the ripple effect of what he is. It's truly disturbing in a way that really works. All of the characters are really well fleshed out and we have a good sense of their motivations and backstories. Everything seems really natural when it comes to dialogue and the way that the kids interact. And one of my favorite things about this book is that Duncan really nails what it's like to be an awkward kid in high school in the opening chapters. Susan does a few things that made the awkward high school kid in me go, oh, I've been there. Altogether, it's really just a well-crafted and carefully crafted book. My only dislike is that sometimes Susan, the main character, can be a little bit too 
naive. There were parts of this book where she made decisions that I felt were too illogical and a little bit frustrating for me as a reader. I felt that she should be more adept at understanding what she should do in that situation in order to keep herself safe. Honestly, in the grand scheme of things, it's a pretty small criticism and one that can probably be explained away by the fact that anyone in that situation would not be able to think straight and not be able to make logical decisions. Guys, pick this book up if you are at all into crime or thriller fiction, and generally if you just like YA. This is a, such a good read. It's compelling, it's gripping, it's rewarding as a reader. I just really, really loved it. Okay, so that's it for my general review. I'm going to be moving into a more detailed analysis now that is not spoiler free. So for those of you that don't want to be spoiled, now is your time to pause the video or jump ahead to this time to see my related book and movie recommendations. All right? Cool. So for the analysis portion of this video, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the horror elements at play here, especially this idea of evil children or killer teens in fiction. If you are a consumer of horror stuff like me, you will recognize the evil child or killer child or killer teen narrative in a lot of different horror things. Just look at movies like The Omen, the Exorcist, Rosemary's Baby, Pet Cemetery. These are just the possession stories. There are so many more. Eden Lake is one of the most harrowing and honestly just one of the scariest movies I have ever seen. And it's just about regular kids committing horrible acts because they have a violent ringleader and they're easily persuaded, much like the teens in Killing Mr. Griffin. I think this is Lois Duncan's most frequently challenged YA novel for a reason. It was number 25 on American Library Association's top 100 most challenged books from the years 2000 to 2009. Most of the challenges have to do with the violence or the obscene language in the book, but I would bet that people's distaste for this book also stems from the fact that we don't like to think about kids committing horrible acts, and not only that, but having the will to justify those horrible acts over and over as if what they did was just totally okay. It makes for awesome horror fiction, but it also makes for controversial fiction, especially when targeted at teens. Now, some might argue that stories like these, stories in the evil child subgenre, actually represent a societal loss of faith in the child as an innocent being. In our current socio-historical context, our construction of the child as a figure involves a certain degree of innocence and purity, right? And this is why we have such a discomfort with these stories. The fact that fictional children could so easily commit murder and so easily justify committing murder seems to imply that children have an innate darkness and an innate evil that sort of goes against everything that many of us believe to be true. But I want to suggest that we actually look at killing Mr. Griffin in another light. Scholar Karen Renner, in terms of the evil child subgenre, suggests that the term evil child might actually be a little bit of an oxymoron. Evil implies a conscious intention, and it implies purposeful decision making, and children and teens are not widely regarded to be quite mature enough yet to make decisions that are purposeful enough to be truly evil without outside influence. This is why the evil in the evil child narrative often has to come from some outside source, whether it be demonic possession or something supernatural, or in Killing Mr. Griffin's case, an outside force that is human but simply psychopathic. Renner makes the argument that the evil child narrative does not actually represent a societal loss of faith in the innocence of the child, but instead it represents a continuous and constant confirmation of the child as an innocent being. And I think this is very true of Killing Mr. Griffin. Let's look at Susan, David, Jeff, and Betsy for a minute. They, of course, all do have some degree of guilt and some degree of responsibility when it comes to the murder of Mr. Griffin, and some definitely more than others, but they also all show some level of discomfort with the actions that they take. The problem is, is that their discomfort is so overshadowed by their fixation with Mark. Duncan herself backs this up when she has Susan's mother say that she hopes that their lawyer can get David, Betsy, and Jeff's charges reduced to second degree murder. Mark is the nucleus around which everything revolves in this story. 
He is the reason that all of this happens. He is the essential evil that corrupts these teens. Killing Mr. Griffin actually confirms the childlike innocence of its teen characters by perpetuating the idea that outside evil must unequivocally be present in order to make children do evil things. And as for Mark, he is of course something totally other. He is a portrait of the magnetic psychopath, right? It doesn't really matter if he is a child or an adult, it would all be the same. He just wants to be an agent of chaos and to harm and kill other living things. One of my favorite things about this book is that we see Mark from almost every other character's point of view, and in every one he seems a bit different. He means something different for each one of these teens, essentially wearing all of these different faces and weaving this complex tapestry of manipulation. It's absolutely chilling. So on that note, you guys, my recommendations today all have to do with the charming psychopath trope or the evil corrupting influence. Middle grade kids, teens, and grown-ups, check out Fox. This is a picture book written by Margaret Wilde and illustrated by Ron Brooks. This is a picture book that's actually geared towards older readers, and it's about a dog and a magpie who have this close friendship that comes under attack from a cruel and creepy fox. Fox has that sort of Mark Kinney-esque magnetism, and I think at one point Magpie even says, he belongs nowhere, he loves no one. It's a very scary book, but also a very moving one as well. The text is positioned in a really interesting way all around the book, so you'll find yourself manipulating the book in really interesting ways while you read it. And the illustrations reflect so well the love between Dog and Magpie and the cold emptiness and danger of Fox. It's one of my favorites of all time, so check it out. Teens and grown-ups, see if you can get a hold of Chronicle from 2012, directed by Josh Trank and starring Dane DeHaan. This is a found footage movie which may or may not be your thing, and I'll admit that it usually isn't mine, but I really, really like this movie. It's about three teenagers who accidentally end up getting supernatural powers, and I don't want to spoil too much, but the powers turn out to be a bit of a corrupting influence, and you see some darker sides start to come out. I really like this movie. Let me know what you think if you watch it. Grown-ups, I am so excited to tell you about You by Caroline Kepnes. Uh, this is one of my favorite horror novels and straight up one of my favorite novels of all time. It stars Joe Goldberg, who is a young psychopath and stalker who becomes obsessed with a woman that patronizes the bookstore that he works at. The book follows him as he meticulously gets closer and closer to her, but the twist is that the book is actually written in second person. So the whole thing is stream of consciousness straight from Joe's brain and directed at the person that he is obsessed with. The result is insane. I was looking over my shoulder, honestly, for two days after reading this book. I just felt like Joe Goldberg was everywhere. He is so immersive and his thoughts are so disturbingly charming and magnetic. He is another great portrait of a magnetic psychopath. I guess you just have to read it to sort of get the idea. So like, stop listening to me, go out, get it from your library or whatever. It's an amazing, amazing book. I would like, I can't recommend it enough. <laughs> All right, guys, that's it for my review and my analysis today. Thank you so much for watching. I'd love to talk with you guys about this topic of killer kids in horror fiction. I find it to be fascinating. So yeah, go ahead and leave a comment. And if you want to see more of me on here, go ahead and like the video and subscribe too. Uh, yeah. All right, guys, hope you have a good night and see you later. Bye.